Hello everyone. Thank you to all of you for joining us for our next Fogarty HA Bionet Collaborative Research Seminar Series. Today we have two wonderful presenters who are both MSc students presenting a talk related to some of the current research. First up, we will have John Okech. John Okech is an MSc student at Pwane University in Kenya under the Eastern African Network for Bioinformatics Training Fellowship. And he will be telling you a little bit about his current master's project. John, if you are ready, you are welcome to go ahead and start your talk. Okay. So hi, everyone. So I'll thank you, Verena, for the introduction. So I'll take you through my master's project focused on comparing the patterns of spread of HNPV and RSV across Africa using virus sequence data. So this is work in progress and I'll appreciate to have your feedback. So I'll talk you a bit through the, in the background of my study, study objectives. I'll talk you through my analysis plan, through some results and wrap up with some concluding remarks. So here I'm showing results from a previous study that this study was called patch study and I'm using samples collected during the study. The study enrolled participants across seven countries shown on X axis, five countries in Africa. In my analysis, I'll be looking at countries, only five African countries. On the Y axis is the etiological frac fraction showing population attributable risk to the different pathogen. And this study was looking at all causes of pneumonia. It recruited both cases and controls. To my interest is HMPV and RSV. So RSV was the main cause of pneumonia and accounted for about 35%. HMPV was also important. And globally, RSV is the main cause of pneumonia in children under five years, although HMPV is not as common as RSV, it's a frequent respiratory pathogen. And to date, we don't have vaccine against the, these two pathogens. And therefore, understanding the geographic spread patterns of these two pathogens is of significant importance. The two pathogens share a range of similarities and provide us with a good example to try and study to try and validate inferences on the respiratory pathogen spread. And clinically, they are indistinguishable. Infection will range from mild upper respiratory tract infection to severe lower respiratory tract disease. That is the characteristic pneumonia and bronchiolitis. And this also overlaps with other respiratory pathogens like flu and COVID-19. HMPV and RSV also have share similar mode of transmission, and this is true respiratory droplet when you come into contact with an infected person or contaminated surfaces. They also have similar genetic structure, although there are minor differences. And we often, these pathogens often occur at the same time of the year, and this usually coincides with cold seasons or high relative humidity. And within epidemics, of the two viruses, we often see co-circulation of multiple genetic groups. And this poses a question, do these viruses also have similar patterns of geographic spread, for example, across Africa? And are these shed light on common modalities of control? So to answer this, so I, we aim to look at the degree of sequence relatedness across the five African countries. So do we see mixing, suggesting a widespread movement of variants and possible transmission across the, across the continent or this isolation? And also I'm using partial gene data. Compared to whole genome, we know that whole genome provides increased resolution and it becomes handy in situations where you 
collected sequences within a, sh a short epidemiological time frame. So we want to assess whether G-gene is adequate to examine phylogeography in details. So here I'm showing the different study sites that enroll across Africa, and these were five study sites uh, shown on the map with these pointers. So for RSV, you have about eight for six sequences that were successfully sequenced, and RSV about 831. And the advantage of this study is that these samples were collected at the same time over a period of two years, and they are distributed across Africa. So we can try to infer the spatial pattern across the continent. So I want to take you through a few concepts that forms the background of my method. That is phylogeography. And here we imply studying evolutional relationship in space and time using phylogenetic methods. And the belief of phylogeography, what I'm calling the change, is how the sequence evolved in space and time. This information is written to gene sequences. So in other, other words, like as the viruses evolve, they acquire informative mutation. And therefore we can use this mutation as sequence tag to track the virus that spread from place to place. And the advantage with the respiratory virus is that they're easily transmitted and they can travel to far distance places harbored in the host. And therefore this process will often occur on the same epidemiological time scale. So here I will just want to present a basic example. It can be complicated more than this. So here I have three subpopulations named A, B, and C. And C, let's say we present my study population. So when we, when we do sampling, we sometimes we often don't know whether there is interaction. So within C, I'm showing subpopulation one to five. Some are in, in interaction shown with the red circles and other isolation. And also when there is good epidemiological tracking and surveillance, we can often tell when introduction occur as shown from population B to C and population A to C. But often we don't know this. So when we sample, what we end up with is just the sequence data and then we construct the phylogenetic tree. But this partial information is hidden in this phylogenetic tree. And therefore, the aim phylogeography is try to recover this partial information. And when you have your sequence data, you reconstruct a phylogenetic tree, the one I'm showing here on my right, sequences from one to five. So when you put these sequences into context of other sequences sampled in other location, for example here, B and A, you can try to inform on the possible sources of introduction into new location. And actually, this sums up my talk today. So how are we going to do this? So here, the blue will show the different software that I'm using. So I have sequence data from the five African countries for HMPV and RSV. I did sequence alignment and then manual curation using uh, Alivio. And then first, we aim to identify the genetic, to classify the genetic diversity, identify the different genetic variants, and then do uh, genotype-specific Bayesian descriptive phylogeography. And here, what we aim to do, so we assign sequences to discrete traits, and this discrete trait represented country, sub-Africa region, and here sub-Africa region uh, will represent Southern Africa, Eastern Africa and Western Africa. This represents the location from which the sampling countries are from. And also on the global scale, we use the continent. So here we just aim to infer dispersal patterns between these discrete locations. Also, on the other hand, we aim to infer transmission, uh, potential transmission links between the countries using POPAT software. I'll talk more about this in the next few slides. So on to my results. Uh, so here I'm showing the different genetic variants for HMPV and RSV. HMPV is the top table. So today I'll just present uh, results on a few selected genetic types. So here uh, 
I'm showing temporal circulation patterns of HMPV and RSV. HMPV panel A and RSV panel B. The different color represent different genetic group. And these charts are stratified by country. There is Zambia, South Africa, Kenya, Gambia, Mali, the same to RSV. So what we are seeing here is that also the single bin uh, represent three month interval period. What we are seeing here is that this co-circulation of multiple genetic groups within a single time frame. And also the other pattern we can see here is that countries from close regions have similar genotype dominance pattern. As you can see here, Zambia and South Africa, the genotype patterns mirror each other, similarly to Gambia and Mali, suggesting strong epidemiological links between close location, same to HMPV. And also we identify some genotypes. For instance, A2A was only detected in Zambia and South Africa and was not seen in other location. And just this will suggest a unique introduction into this location that was never seen in other African countries. So here uh, we aim further to assess that within country genetic diversity, and this is a maximum molecular phylogenetic tree. The branch that represents the genetic distance. So here I'm showing the results for Kenya and Mali, randomly selected. I'll just home in into a single country. This is Mali. So the tip shapes here represent different location. And we can see that sequences from different locations, they are mixed within the phylogenetic clusters or clades. So this suggests upon introduction in the country, there's rapid spread of variants within the country. And how do these pattern compare across the continent? So this is HMPVB1. So here we identified two genetic clusters, main clusters shown in blue and green. So I've labeled them cluster B1C1, cluster B1C2. I'll refer to these clusters later in my presentation. And within cluster, we are seeing that sequences from close regions, they will largely cluster together. The tip shapes here represent country of sampling. So this is Gambia and Mali. We can see that closely cluster together into monophyletic clades. Kenya is related there. So on my right is a pop -up network. And pop -up, what it does, it shows you shared nucleotide differences without regard to an evolutionary model. So here we aim to identify genetic clusters made of sequences from different countries that were regarded highly similar. And the plan here was to uh, do whole genome sequencing and further resolve the patterns and just assess whether it's possible transmission links. But this was not possible due to the current situation. Uh, we don't have access to our labs. So we also assess the clustering pattern of these sequences globally. And similar analysis was done across all the other HMPV genotypes. So here I'm showing uh, on, this is panel A, this is panel B. These are time resolved phylogenetic tree. Just a similar presentation to what I've seen, but the difference here is you assessing genetic related at the same time you also reconstructing ancestral state location. And the tree branch is colored by Africa subregion. So still we see this clustering by region. And to my right is inferred viral migration patterns of HMPV B1. So the lines indicate connection between the countries. And this does not mean necessarily that a transmission occurred between the location, but others will just suggest high sequence relatedness. But we inferred strong links between Gambia and Mali, suggesting strong epidemiological links. So we went further to explore the patterns globally. So at first we set to limit our analysis to only same time frame as our sampling period shown in the blue margin. But this was not possible. We don't have a lot of HMPV data in the global. So we took everything from 2000 to 2018 just to try to inform on the potential sources of introduction into Africa. So here I'm showing time result phylogenetic tree of HMPVB1 viruses. The tree is colored by continent. As you can see the branches. 
and the African clusters are shown in gray boxes. The black boxes here shows time to most recent common ancestor alongside the most uh, probable location to each clade, to each African clade rather. So here, the two clusters that we identified, B1C1 and B1C2, they fell into separate clades in sparse of the global sequences, suggesting at least two distinct variants of HMPV B1 viruses circulated in these African regions. And still on the global scale, the pattern is seen as this clustering of sequences by Africa subregion. But the other challenge we had is that most of the sequences here are from Africa and Asia, so therefore we did not assess potential introduction from other sources. So on the global scale, we also reconstructed the dispersal patterns. Uh, the lines indicate connection between the countries. Uh, the color red to blue shows relative strength of connection. Still strong connection between Gambia and Mali were inferred. Uh, so we did a similar analysis for the rest of the groups. So from in the next, in these slides, I'll just show you a snapshot for the different genetic groups. So this is HMPV A2B as a different variant from HMPV B1. Similarly, we identified at least two genetic variants, and we can see the bootstrap values here. On the global scale, we are seeing that still sequences from African subregion, so this is South African Zambia, clustered there into monophyletic clades away from Kenya. And these sequences, uh, A2BC1 and A2, this is also the same cluster, they were regarded as highly similar, but still we can see on the global scale that they are placed into separate clusters, and this will also suggest separate introduction into Africa. And what you realize that most of uh, the basal branches are from sequences from other regions. And this will suggest ancestral strains may reside in sequences outside, may reside in regions outside Africa or from unsampled locations. So we did the same analysis for RSV just to compare the patterns. And now on this slide, I'll just give you a snapshot of the results. So this RSV genotype ON1, a single genotype. So still we are seeing a clustering by region, the tip should represent the different country. These are inferred uh, spatial patterns. Still we see strong links between South Africa and Zambia different uh, results for the different genotype. We are observing similar results. Largely sequences from the same region will cluster together and strong links in fact between close regions. So in summary, so we've seen that there's HMPV and RSV epidemic are characterized by co-circulation of multiple genetic groups. There is geographical clustering of sequences and what we think is that Upon introduction into Africa, there's more interaction between neighboring countries and therefore there's an establishment of a local epidemic. And also we have observed similar genotype dominance patterns between neighboring countries, suggesting strong epidemiological links between neighboring countries. And based on these results, HMPV and RSV share similar patterns of geographic spread. And on the global scale, we have seen that our sequences mix well with sequences detected in other places globally. So our future work will focus on HMPV, on rather RSV global phylogeography, and now compare the patterns with HMPV on the global scale. So, our recommendation from what we think from our analysis is that vaccine use in Africa may require multi-strain design. So I want to acknowledge the following. Our funders and my supervisors. And I want to say, say thank you to all.
I'm happy to take your questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation, John. Okay. Um, we, we will take questions at the end after uh, our next presenter delivers her talk first. Um, we prefer that both presenters deliver their talks in, in completion so that we can ensure that both of them get the opportunity to deliver their, their full talks um, in case one of them runs over. So, John, thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to kindly stop sharing your screen uh, and then Brenda, who is our next presenter, can go ahead and start sharing hers. And, and while you're doing that, I thought that I would just quickly do a, a very quick short introduction for Brenda. So Brenda Udosen is currently pursuing a master's degree in bioinformatics at the African Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics, um, University of Science in Bamako, Mali. She is, <clears throat> sorry, she is presently working um, on a thesis which is focused on the implementation of genome-wide analysis methods to understand the genetics of hypertension in African populations. So Brenda, as soon as you are ready, you are welcome to go ahead and begin your presentation. Good day, everybody. My name is Brenda Odosen Otobo. I'm here to talk on the components of my thesis, which is on the multivariant approach to evaluate the genetics of hypertension in African population. Hypertension, which is otherwise called high blood pressure, is a cardiovascular complex disease which arises when the pressure in your blood vessels is unusually high. And one is considered to have high blood pressure when the systolic reading with 140 and the diastolic with 90. Blood pressure is determined both by the amount of blood your heart pumps and the amount of resistance to blood flow in your arteries. The more blood your heart pumps and the narrower your arteries, the higher your blood pressure. This leads to different medical conditions such as stroke, eye damage, heart attack, kidney damage, which they all eventually lead to death. World Health Organization have estimated that more than 1.13 billion people have hypertension globally with over 7.5 million deaths in the year 2015. From this distrib distribution on my right, it is shown that the prevalence of hypertension is much higher in African ancestry individuals. It is highly prevalent in the older population, which is estimated at 57%. More worrisome is that fewer than one in five people with hypertension have the problem under control. The risk factors of hypertension can be classified into two, which are the modifiable and the non-modifiable factors. For the modifiable factors, we have excessive salt intake, And we have obesity and we have chronic stress. For the non-modifiable factor, we have age. As we age, her blood vessels gradually lose some of their elastic quality, which can contribute to increased blood pressure. However, children also can develop high blood pressure. Ethnicity. African ancestry individuals tend to develop high blood pressure more often than people of any other racial background. Sex. Studies shows that 
until the age of 64, men are more likely to get high blood pressure than women, while women are more likely to get high blood pressure at 65 and above. Genetic pressure. However, it is also likely that people with a family history of high blood pressure share common environmental factors such as diet, which may eventually increase their risk. The genetic architecture of complex traits. This indicates the y-axis, which represents the effect size, ranging from the smallest to the highest, while the x-axis is the allele frequency. This reveals that complex traits, one of which is hypertension, have both the rare and the common variant. However, the common variants have small effect sizes, which can be identified using GWAS analytical approach. This brings me to genome-wide association study. Genome-wide association studies, which is otherwise called GWAS, is a powerful approach used to identify genetic variants involved in human disease and traits. The method involves scanning the genomes for many different people and looking for genetic markers that can be used to predict the presence of a disease. Once such genetic markers are identified, they can be used to understand how genes contribute to the disease and develop a better prevention and strategies. GWAS analysis is, however, generally univariant in nature. This, this implies that it focuses on a single phenotype. However, many human traits are highly correlated. Example, the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure, they are highly correlated. This correlation can be leveraged to improve the power of genetic association tests, which will further identify markers associated with one or more of the traits. For example, a gene descent located chromosome A, it's known to be associated with multiple cancer types and multiple GWAS has demonstrated that this region is associated with prostate, breast, colon, ovarian, bladder, and leukemia. Limited study of GWAS in African descent has, however, been studied. The GWAS of blood pressure has been well studied. According to GWAS catalog, there are at least 165 GWAS of blood pressure, which have identified thousands of genetic variants. This includes the recent GWAS analysis in over 1 million people. This study alone identified 535 novel loci associated with blood pressure traits. Unfortunately, there are only two GWAS of blood pressure that have been done in continental Africa with no genome-wide significant genetic variant identified to be associated with this threat. However, the study from South Africa highlighted 10 genetic variants of interest having a p-value of 5 times 10 raised to the power of minus 5. As objective, in this work, we aim to form the multivariate GWAS analysis of systolic and diastolic blood pressure in more than 14,000 individuals using GWAS MARI statistics. My strategies include replication of genetic variants of interest at the p-value of five times 10 raised to the power of minus five, which will then be carried out in 56,000 African-American individuals in million veteran program, as well as 7,000 black participant individuals in UK Power Bank. I will then conduct a meta-analysis of all these at cohort to perform the largest GWAS of blood pressure in black ancestry individuals. Our study population will be using a summary statistics data from four cohorts in the African ancestry, the Uganda Genome Resource, the Ban Diabetes Study, the Duban Case Control Study, as well as African-American Diabetes Mellitus.
and we'll be using a total of more than 14,000 individuals for the analysis. There are many methods that implemented multivariate approach. This method generally use individual level data as well as summary statistics. As you may know, it's always difficult to get access to individual level data. And my approach in this work, you will be using summary statistics data of the largest GWAS of hypertension in Africa using MTAC method. As, can be, as, can, as you can see here, we have MTAC listed as one of the methods which can be used for multivariate approach. This slide shows the workflow of my analysis. As you can see, I have used the software called Multi-Trade Analysis of GWAS, that is MTAC. As part of my data quality control, I excluded SNPs with minor allow. of less dark to the mesh of the sonic pressure in for covariance metrics and output results will then be visualized using Manhattan and QQ plots. Diastolic trait, GWAS diastolic trait, which is a Manhattan plot. The x axis shows chromosome 1 to 22, while the y axis indicates the negative log of the p value of the genetic variance. The red line show is a threshold which shows SNPs having a p value of less than 5 times 10 raised to the power of minus 7. Already, we can see a signal at chromosome 9 and chromosome 13. On the left is a QQ this analysis. Adebra, um, I'm not sure if you are still. It's the part of blood pressure using univariant GWAS, while the Manhattan plot on the right shows the systolic blood pressure using multivariate GWAS approach. The multivariate GWAS analysis obviously has more power in detecting genetic significant variants than the univariate GWAS. This demonstrate that multivariate GWAS method increased power to detect and also identify association, which was not initially identified using the univariate GWAS approach. The next step, my next step is now to replicate those association in two populations. This include more than 56,000 African-American million veteran, as well as 7,000 black participants. This analysis will be completed in the next two weeks. Finally, after replication, we aim to internalize the summary statistics from all the cohorts. My next step is now to replicate those associations. When completed, this would be the largest GWAS of blood pressure and the first multivariate GWAS of blood pressure in African ancestry individuals. In summary, there's a higher prevalence of hypertension, of high blood pressure among individuals of African ancestry. However, in previous studies that have been conducted, there was no GWAS of blood pressure. That the, in previous study that was conducted, there was no genome-wide significant variance that was identified on those work. And based on what, based on my analysis, it can be deduced that multivariate GWAS method increases statistical power 
and identify association that was not initially found in univariate Dewar's approach. I wish to acknowledge my supervisor in person of Dr. Fatum Shegun Fatumo for his great supervision and his availability. I also wish to acknowledge my assistant supervisor in person of Professor Welemo Madu. Also acknowledge Professor Onye Kambi Nash for the availability of resources which was used for the analysis. Also acknowledge Dr. Tinashi for his reproductive input as well as the African Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics, where I'm currently doing my program. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Brenda, for a very interesting presentation. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's presentation portion of our seminar. Um, I'd now like to open up the floor for discussion or questions. Um, so are there any questions for, for Brenda or for John? Our first presenter, you are welcome to raise your hand. Um, you can speak if you would like to unmute yourself or you are welcome to chat you, to sorry, type your question into the chat box and then I will read it um, aloud. Hello. 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 Uh, do you have a question or a comment? Yes. Yes, my name is Nash, and uh, I'm very happy and uh, wish to thank the two presenters for making it today. The two are, uh, to me, they look a very good presentation. I will not ask uh, Brenda anything, but I will ask John that uh, in view of of uh, the uh, similarity of uh, the outcome of uh, HMPV, RSVV, or COVID-19 infection, uh, is there any sequence similarity? Uh, otherwise, when people with uh, RSV or HMPV goes for diagnosis, maybe they, may, they might be misdiagnosed. So, uh, so I'll say most of these molecular diagnostics are very specific. And therefore, I think we will be able to discriminate between the, the different pathogens. And also the, this, uh, the two viruses, HMPV, RSV, and also COVID, they are, they are, they are different mm -hmm. in terms of uh, maybe sequence or the there are differences, there are inherent differences. And the methods are very specific. Um, okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. Uh, Martha, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, you're welcome to go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, so I, I have a question for John. I'm just curious to know how he defined a phylogenetic cluster. Uh, there's a phylogenetic tree where he showed two clusters, I think B, I, C1, and the cluster one and cluster two. So I'm just curious whether did he follow any protocol or did he just uh, look at how the phylogenetic tree looked like? And I, I think for Brenda, I might have missed it, but uh, you say when you compare the multivariate GWAS versus the univariate GWAS, it was, uh, okay, yeah, the multivariate was more, had more markers. Um, maybe I missed it, but now which factors did you look at in the multivariate that you didn't look at in the univariate? Kindly clarify that. Thank you. Uh, yes. John, I'll give you uh, an opportunity to respond first. Thank you, Martha. The genetic cluster that was based on pragmatic approach and you clusters that were supported by bootstrap values greater than 95% will be identified as separate variants from the rest. Thank you, John. Um, Martha, I'm not sure that that 
completely answers your question, um, but I will give Brenda an opportunity to then respond to the question addressed to her. Brenda? Hi, thank you for the question. The factors that was looked at in the, using the multivariate approach is using the univariate approach, it doesn't really put into consideration individual relatedness. Whereas using the multivariate approach, we will consider individual relatedness. That's actually the factors that differentiate the multivariate and the univariate. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Martha, I'm, I'm assuming that that answered uh, your questions. Yes, yes, it did. Okay, great. So, Kehinde, I see you have your hand up. You're welcome to ask your question. Uh, thank you very much for the good talk, John. Um, my question to you is that how did you screen your alignment for recombinant? Because I'm well aware that those viruses, they are, they are any viruses. You're going to have a lot of recombinants in there. So I want to know, did you, did you consider that? Did you screen your alignment for recombinants? No, I didn't screen my alignment for recombinant, but we've been, uh, so I said this was a sub-study of a major study, and we normally look at the evolution of this, the different pathogens. Uh, what I can see, we don't, uh, I'm not so sure if there are recombination, do occur, but we often don't see a lot of recombination, but I can go ahead and try to do that. Yeah, I, I think you, sh you, can, you can just try and give that a shot because there's no way you can, you can't, you, can't, you can't actually de de describe recombinant with a single tree. So it's recombinant, you know, recombinant in your, in your data will readily undermine the, the downstream process. So that's why we always try as much as possible to get rid of the recombinant before making your tree. Yeah. You can just try that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kende. Um, are there any other questions for either John or Brenda? I don't see any hands raised, uh, but you're welcome to unmute yourselves and just ask a question if you have any. Okay, so I don't see any further questions coming in. Um, no last minute questions? No. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this seminar today. Thank you very much to both John and Brenda for making yourselves available and for two really wonderful presentations. Um, I really appreciate both of you taking out some time out of your days to deliver this and being online. And thank you to everybody who joined the seminar for taking time out of your days to, to listen to them and to provide some feedback and um, some wonderful questions. So thank you very much for joining us. That brings us to the end. Any announcements from uh, Albert? Albert, is there, there anything you'd like to say? Um, thank you. We will meet in two weeks time. That's on 7th July. Uh, we have a talk from Christos and, and Mohammed. So um, I'll kindly ask that uh, they send us their slides and buy. Yeah, that's all for now. Thanks. Thanks, Albert. Okay, so if there are no further comments, uh, no further announcements, then I'd like to formally close today's seminar. And we'll see you in two weeks for the next two seminar presentations. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.